today we have with us Dr. Ajay Shah, who is a professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, and uh, who also headed the uh, research team uh, at FSLRC. Uh, Dr. Shah, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, so, based on your experience uh, in the FSLRC, uh, could you talk to us about the need to overhaul the current regulatory uh, architecture and how the draft IFC uh, aims to correct them? And what are the key recommendations of the IFC? Uh, we need to change course on financial regulation because what we have is broken. Okay, so that's the main point, exactly. that there are so many things going wrong mm -hmm. in the Indian financial system mm -hmm. that they need to be addressed. Okay, what are all the things going wrong? There are consumers being mistreated. Mm -hmm. There are households and firms who are cut off from the formal financial system. Every now and then we seem to get into a banking crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a well-functioning bond market. Mm -hmm. We don't get long-term financing for infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. I could go on and on. There are so many things about the financial system which mm -hmm. are broken. And when you start asking why, mm -hmm. the answers take you to the problem. That the whole structure, the whole edifice was not designed for this age. It was designed for a different world. There are laws that were done in the 30s. There are laws that were done in the 50s. These laws, the agencies that the laws have created, are simply not addressing the needs of today's India. India has changed dramatically from the time when these things were being done. So we went through colonial rule. We went through socialism. And we were a very, very poor country at the time. Now we face a different environment. So there is a need to rethink the whole thing. Now what do you need? What do you mean by rethinking the whole thing? A couple of big issues. Uh, one is that a lot of the present laws are oriented around a central planning approach where a government agency gets a lot of power and it can do whatever it wants. Now that's bad economics and bad governance. It's bad economics because you don't want a government agency meddling in every aspect of how the financial system works. And it's bad governance because when an agency has unlimited power to meddle, it will give you the wrong outcomes. Mm -hmm. An agency has to have an objective. The fundamental principle of FSLRC is that every agency has to have an objective mm -hmm. against which it can be held accountable. Mm -hmm. If you don't test the performance of an agency against well understood objectives, mm -hmm. then it is in the nature of all political and bureaucratic creations that they will pursue power, they will become lazy, they will become corrupt, and you will get non-performance. So the whole idea of FSLRC is to create a few financial regulatory organizations which have clarity of objective, which do things that are required in the country, which can be held accountable for the things that they do. Um, along those lines, so one of uh, the main provisions that the IFC uh, seeks, uh, makes is that it wants to do away with the sector-wise regulation that you just spoke about and subsume all these regulatory bodies um, under one umbrella. So uh, what are the ad uh, advantages of this convergence and how do such well-established bodies actually prepare themselves for this? So what's going on is that in the olden days, we created these organizations. Okay, So for example, we created the Forward Markets Commission. Mm -hmm. And we gave the Forward Markets Commission a lot of power to do something on commodity futures. We never quite specified what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Now, in the modern world, we want to think about the question, what's the market failure? And we want to go address that market failure. Mm -hmm. Okay, So we no longer think in terms of sectors. Mm -hmm. We think in terms of what is the objective of the agency? What is the function of the agency? And the function cannot be that I'm going to do oversight of some sector. Mm -hmm. The function has to be something deeper. So for example, one of the basic market failures in finance is consumer protection. Mm -hmm. okay. All too often, financial firms are not fair on how they deal with households. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have separate, separate sectoral regulators, mm -hmm then it creates a very unhappy environment. Mm -hmm. So we have an insurance regulator, which is IRDA, and we have a mutual funds regulator, which is SEBI, and we have a banking regulator, which is RBI. Now what happens is each of these regulators ends up getting sucked into the worldview of the firms that they deal with, and then it's a race to the bottom. RBI wants to dilute regulations so that banks make more money. IRDA wants to dilute regulations so that insurance companies make more money. 
SEBI wants to worry that mutual funds should be competitive against the sales practices of insurance companies. Mm -hmm. And that's a completely dysfunctional way to think about it. Instead, what we should be thinking is, can we keep Indian consumers safe? Mm -hmm. And that requires treating consumers fairly in a symmetric way across sectors. So whether I eat ice cream or I eat Maggi noodles, mm -hmm. I should have the same food safety regulator because food safety is a function. Mm -hmm. You don't want to split food safety by ice cream and soft drinks mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, that's what we've done in finance. Mm. So consumer protection is the mission of financial regulation and it should be done in a consistent and symmetric way across the financial system. It shouldn't be the case that we have an inconsistent treatment between insurance and mutual funds because then that leads to very big distortions. So if the insurance regulator has lax regulations, then the market share of insurance companies goes up. Mm -hmm. And then unfortunately the mutual funds start lobbying that we too should have less consumer protection. So it's a very bad arrangement, the way things are being done today. And uh, you spoke about uh, you know consumer pr protection. And uh, so with more private firms coming in, the IFC actually introduces these uh, concepts like consumer protection and safeguards against uh, market abuse. So um, what uh, what is the importance of introducing these in an emerging market like India? Well, simply put, Consumers should not be mistreated. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty good objective yeah. that the working of the market economy should cater to welfare defined broadly. Mm -hmm. And it should not be the case that you've got a small bunch of people who are profiting enormously mm -hmm. at the expense of consumers. Okay, so that's nobody wants to go there. That's not something that we should build. Mm -hmm there is most certainly the incipient beginnings of that kind of mess in India today. Because we started out with socialism where everything was bad. Now we have started bringing in financial firms into it, mm -hmm. as we should. Mm -hmm. But then alongside that, we need the commensurate safeguards. Let me say this differently, okay? Suppose you didn't give a damn about consumers. Okay? Suppose you said, look, a few people get cheated here and there, it doesn't bother me. I claim that that will still not get us a well-functioning financial system because fundamentally households know what is good for them. Okay, If the financial system will continue to cheat households the way things have been going today, the households will just go on strike, the households will walk away. Mm -hmm. The households will put their money in gold, the households will put their money in real estate, the households will take their money out of the country. Mm -hmm. If we actually want a domestic financial system, then we have to be fair to households. And that means many things. It means creating a regulatory capacity for consumer protection. It means a government that borrows at the market price, which doesn't force banks and insurance companies to take its bonds. It means having a financial regulatory apparatus so that banks don't go bankrupt and insurance companies don't go bankrupt and so on. So it requires many, many things. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the long run objective has got to be mm -hmm. that households feel safe and they feel trusting. Only then will the vast resources of the Indian households get intermediated through the Indian financial system and feedback into the growth of the country. Uh, so finally, we are a, a political economy think tank and we generally want to see how, what's the politics in this. So interested in the politics of how these things get done. So can you tell us some, uh, what would be some of the key challenges that uh, you know, one would f or a country would face when uh, we want, uh, we are carrying out such a fundamental overhaul of the financial system? Uh, it's interesting. So elsewhere in the world, uh, private financial firms have been a very strong force in lobbying. Mm -hmm. And there have been many problems in doing financial sector reforms mm -hmm. because there are focused interests. India is in a very interesting stage mm -hmm. that we really don't have a big private financial system mm -hmm. and it has not mobilized politically. So there's really not much cure going on by way of politics. Uh, households are not connected with financial sector reforms. They're far away. So to give an analogy, I think of it like trade reforms. Mm -hmm. When India did trade reforms, households didn't care. Mm -hmm. It was the rich business families who were unhappy that tariffs were coming down and their factories would come under more competition. Households didn't care. So this is not a voter issue. Mm -hmm. So I think it's actually not difficult to do financial sector reforms in India because it's not a voter issue. It's not like cutting a food subsidy where you know the average man on the street mm -hmm. may notice, they may mobilize, they may uh, take up processions on the streets protesting against the reforms. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, financial sector reforms are not a voter issue and this is true everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. In India, you do not have a large 
mobilization of private financial firms who would like to dilute some of these provisions. So I don't think there is much opposition to financial reforms in India. It's not too complicated. Some of the stuff done in the past was more difficult. For example, in the early 90s, the reforms of the BSC. Now that was really difficult because there were 600 members of the BSC and they had a lot at stake because they were reaping the fruits of the malfunctioning of the BSC. So they had mobilized themselves to try to block change. That was more difficult. Compared with that, this is easy. Okay, thank you uh, for joining us. Thanks. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you.